Hi everyone, and welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, a podcast where our goal is to read the entire Bible in a year, seeking to understand God's plan of redemption while discovering daily and practically your part in it. All right, everybody, welcome back to God's Plan, Your Part. My name's Ryan. I'm here today with Jenny. (laughs) And we are looking at Exodus 28 and 29. Um, there's a lot of kind of like specifics about how a priest should dress uh, and then just basically like committing to the fact that Aaron and his sons will be priests, basically. Um, so as we're reading over these things, what stuck out to you, Jenny? I was saying earlier that I really like this chapter because I think it just gives like these intricate details of what was set up or what was, I guess, put together for Aaron Um, and his sons to be wearing uh, when they enter the temple in the presence of God. So it's just, it's really cool to me because it's such intricate details, like the tribes of Israel that are represented um, in the the precious jewels or stones that are used. Um, There's specific colorings and embroidery that's done on the, the robes. And it's just like, it's really, really interesting how it's so specific and each part holds like a really unique meaning and I just think it's really cool like they're preparing him for his task um and just making sure that those details are really adhered or that they adhere to them um I think it's really cool I am very crafty myself so I like hearing these intricate details of what went into what Aaron had to wear when approaching God's presence. It's pretty cool. It's kind of interesting. There's a lot of symbolism in it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of beauty in it. And there's a lot of just like tangible functional details in it. Mm-hmm. And so the symbolism, like you'll see that there are like jewels called out and there's supposed to be 12 of them for the 12 tribes. Mm-hmm. Um, tangible practical details are supposed to be bells on the robes yeah. um, so that people know when there's a priest near them. Um, and I think also so that they can kind of tell where the priest is, uh, beyond like the curtain or in the tabernacle, Mm -hmm. like they can just be aware of where they're at because there is a holiness factor to this. Uh, the priests are not holy, right? but you do need to be aware of like, remember when God was on the mountain and God was like, Hey, don't, don't let them touch the mountain. Um, there is something about holiness that is lost to us, I think, because we just don't appreciate it as much Mm -hmm. as generations have in the past. Uh, but it is something to be taken very seriously. So what's the what's the deal with the bells as far as people knowing where he is? Like, I think it's actually just so that they don't like bump into him or is that a like, real thing? I think so, yeah. I think it's so that they're aware of his location. And again, the the actual priest is not holy, but he is um consecrated mm-hmm. and ordained for the task. Yeah. So if he did touch somebody who was unclean it would require them, I think, to go through like the that whole, whole process, process again. again. So it is helpful to be like jingling around. <laughs> like, hey, just so you know, I'm ordained for this task. Please don't bump into me. Um, it's also, like a weird thing though. Like, it's like physical versus spiritual. Like, it's like assuming okay. that bad spirits rub off on you, I guess. No, 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 no. Seems really weird to me. It's not bad spirits. It's that you have to be holy, clean, and consecrated before the Lord. And it's recognizing the serious of sin. And so we have, like in our world today, we have separated and sometimes even eliminated a spiritual from physical. So their understanding of physical and spiritual, I think, would have been much more one and the same. Hmm. So, I mean, think of, I mean, think of what we were just reading about uh, God having power over the, the demons that were the other gods of Egypt. Like their awareness of the spiritual reality would have been much more certain. Um, and therefore I think their understanding of needing to be like clean before God is much more certain. I think actually it would be helpful for us to a certain degree. So if I'm drunk and I run into the priest, he's screwed. Well, I mean, he's unclean for sure. That word unclean. I don't, I don't think I like, I'm aware enough of what it means or what it entails that it's like, it feels gross. It's just essentially like, I mean, you guys will see, stick around for the reading, read it for yourself. You'll see there's like a very long process to making sure that the blood of the sacrifice covers the sin of the people. 
And so, like, the actual blood of the sacrifice is covering the priest himself. They're actually supposed to put the blood, like, on their clothes, on their ears, on, like, they're basically, it calls out their ears, their thumbs, and their toes because they are exposed skin. So, like, the covering is the, the robes and stuff. Uh, the skin is covered by the blood. Like, it's like there must be atonement for sin. Ultimately, all of this is an allusion to the fact that Jesus is coming to atone for our sin. I was going to say, I am just really thankful that I did not live in hey, that time. It, it's really important to understand this. very, very, very important to understanding your picture of God, particularly in the Old Testament. They were not saved by these sacrifices. Like, it's not like, hey, if you didn't sacrifice 10 cows before you died, would you go to hell? It's not like that. The, the, the sacrifice of Jesus covers the sin of the people before and the people after. It's all the things that were required to do in faith. So these people were offering sacrifices in faith to the Lord that he would provide a covering for their sin. The ultimate covering he provided was Jesus. That's why later on in the Bible, we'll see God rejecting the sacrifices of the people. Like he's because like, why? well, if it was their salvation, it wouldn't make sense that God would reject it. So that he's rejecting their sacrifices because their hearts are wrong in what they're doing. It's like they're just being religious about it. So they should be purifying themselves before the Lord, repenting of their sin before the Lord and covering themselves with the blood of the sacrifice so that they can approach the Lord boldly. You know a lot more than I do. No, it's not. It's just, it's, it's very important because if you misunderstand it and you think, that people were saved by the blood of lambs and bulls, you'll miss Jesus. Like your understanding of Jesus will be like a little I bit think diluted. I, I think I get that part. It's just, uh, it just seems like a lot. It and is, it yeah. almost, in a way, it almost feels like, like Aaron's job took the responsibility off of individuals. No. That's what it feels like. So I'm the, realizing that's not the actual yeah. case, but that's what it feels like, which makes me think like, uh, who cares if I'm unclean? Okay, so this is helpful just because you're bringing it up. Exodus 19.6 calls out Israel as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Mm -hmm. So allow scripture to interpret scripture. God has already said that every Israelite is a priest they're like part of a kingdom of priests. So the entire nation itself is called out with the task to bring people who don't know God closer to God. And now there's a priest to that nation of priests to represent them before God. So they all have a unique responsibility, but now the priests have an even higher responsibility to intercede on behalf of God. Uh, later on in Hebrews, we'll see the writer of Hebrews say that uh, Jesus is the great high priest who's interceding on behalf of the people. So Jesus intercedes before the Father for us, even to this day. Um, and he covers us with his blood, just like the, the bulls and the calves and all that stuff. So it's there's tricky stuff. I understand it's hard to wrap our heads around because we're not, we're not this way anymore. Like our culture doesn't understand it. It really baffles me. Like it, <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. I think it's seeing how like some of these pieces came to be, like the actual garments that they had to wear is really cool and the significance of the different pieces really is interesting to me but when it comes down to like the actual process and like what things mean in accordance to the people's cleanliness or that's like that honestly is just really confusing to me it's pretty foreign it is confusing it definitely is uh, but we'll see more and more about the sacrificial system we'll talk about it more we don't have to tackle it all mm -hmm. today uh, but stick with the readings, stick with the story. Yeah. We'll see a little bit more clearly. One um, thing I did notice that yep. I did appreciate a lot that was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, like I said, <clears throat> or maybe I didn't say, I don't remember. Uh, but I really appreciate like all things like crafty and um, creative. So like I said earlier, reading about how all these pieces came to be was really awesome. But at the beginning of, what is it, 28? Yeah. In 28.3... There is mention of how uh, God basically, like, put his... Actually, let me just read it. I don't want to butcher it. It says, um, You shall speak to all the skillful, whom I have filled with a spirit of skill, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. So the part that really stuck out was that um, God's basically telling him, or telling Moses, I have filled these people with the spirit of skill. 
So it makes me wonder, like, did he have to sit down and give them all these directions or did like the Lord just put that in them that they just knew what to do? Um, so it's just cool to see how that spirit shows up. Yeah, it, it definitely, uh, and we'll see this actually happen in a couple chapters. It might be tomorrow, it might be the next day. Uh, Ohalab and Bezalel are the first people in the Bible to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And who What's, are they? Uh, they're just, they're craftspeople, basically. Okay. What's interesting about it is a lot of times we can believe the Holy Spirit is all about ministry. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, that, that preacher, man, he's filled with the Spirit. Um, and it's kind of like a goofy understanding of what the spirit is for, because the spirit does enable us for ministry. I mean, ultimately these craftsmen are being enabled to build the things that are required for ministry. Um, but it's not always a speaker, right? Like things come in exactly. Many different forms. So the Holy spirit is going to give people power to do the things that God has asked them to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, what's interesting is in the old Testament, the Holy Spirit falls on people at specific times for specific purposes. Like and this. It's, it's mm-hmm. not like a, it's not a prolonged indwelling. Uh, but in the New Testament now, we can, as believers, possess the Spirit of God uh, for all time, like for our lifetime. Mm-hmm. And we like, we at times might need like a new filling. Still mm-hmm. kind of like figuring that out. Um, but it is different. So that is like a very clear difference, Old Testament, New Testament yeah. uh, thing. But it is cool that here we see God promising his spirit. It's not a New Testament thing um, for the, the craftsmen. All these crafty people. So if uh, one more kind of parting thought on this thing, um, if it's confusing to you that there's so many rules about <laughs> the, the garments and like the clothing and everything, Um, it's helpful for me to think through it in terms of if you have to wear a uniform, um, and I know this is more serious than just any old uniform, but I worked at Lancaster Bible college for a while and I was their, uh, fleet mechanic and I had to wear a, just, (laughs) this is a very fancy uniform for a fleet mechanic, Mm -hmm. but I had to wear like a polo, um, that had the, the brand on it. And it's funny, like, I remember our boss saying, like, hey, when you have that thing on, like, I don't I don't care if you're, like, down at Sheets. I don't care, like, the gas station. I don't care if you're, like, going mm-hmm. out for lunch. If you have that brand on, you need to represent who we are. And you can't be doing crazy stuff <laughs> with your college-branded logo stuff on. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure any of you that wear uniforms for work, you're probably familiar with conversations like that. And so I think it's helpful to think through the lens of, like, God is giving his priests a uniform. And I'm sure that when they put that thing on, um, they understood the significance of the task and they felt the weight of what God was asking them to do. And so I I know that that is probably like a a brazen oversimplification of the high priestly garments. Um, But it's helpful for me to think through that lens. Like, man, you're like putting on what it means to be an intercessor for the people, Mm -hmm. what it means to be a representative of God. Um, and they actually, they were supposed to like live in those clothes for seven days as part of this ordination and stuff. So they would have stuff all over. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So they would have felt the weight of that. They would have felt the, um, seriousness of that. And I think, I think it's actually pretty cool. Um, (laughs) You would hunter man. (laughs) I, I, not the covered in blood thing. Just like the God. Just imagine them just like putting it on their cheeks like the football players do. God is calling out like, Hey, this is a serious task and I'd like you to handle it well. So, so my takeaway is we don't have high priests anymore. Like, yeah. And I think maybe that's like a little bit of an unsettling thing too. Like that's Jesus is our high priest, Yes, but we now believe in a priesthood of all believers. And so to some degree, we're wearing that uniform all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's helpful, uh, to remember that, to remember that you are a representative, uh, Corinthians says an ambassador of Christ. So we're representing him at all times. Yeah. So I think that 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 right there is like the key piece for me, because I think as a believer of Jesus, I put him in that place and to hear someone else in it is kind of like awkward. I think that's what gets me. But they're not providing salvation. Right. They're just interceding. Right. So there is a difference, and it's important to understand it, and we will see this, Mm -hmm. um, a fuller picture of this as we go. So I will be back again tomorrow. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye. Exodus 28. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. 
Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithmar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful, whom I have filled with the spirit of skill, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and of the fine twined linen, skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges, so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it, and be of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. You shall take two onyx stones, and engrave them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, in order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. You shall make settings of gold filigree, and two chains of pure gold, twisted like cords, and you shall attach the corded chains to the settings. You shall make a breastpiece of judgment and skilled work. In the style of the ephod you shall make it, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen shall you make it. It shall be square and doubled, a span of its length, and a span of its breadth. You shall set it in four rows of stones, a row of seridus, topaz, and tarbuncle shall be the first row, the second row an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, and the third row a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold filigree. There shall be twelve stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its own name, for the twelve tribes. You shall make for the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold, and you shall make the breastpiece two rings of gold, and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece. And you shall put the two cords of the gold in the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. The two ends of the cords you shall attach to the two settings of filigree, and so attach it to the front of the shoulder pieces of the ephod. You shall make the two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breast piece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And you shall make two rings of gold and attach them to the front of the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod, at its seams above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they shall bind the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, so that it may lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, so that the breast piece shall not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel and the breast piece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring, the regu- to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breast piece of judgment you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it, with a woven binding around the opening like the opening of a garment, so that it may not tear. On its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns around its hem with bells of gold between them, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and it shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, so that he does not die. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. 
it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall be regularly on his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. You shall weave the coat in checker work of fine linen, and you shall make a turban of fine linen, and you shall make a sash embroidered with needlework. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty, and you shall put them on Aaron your brother, and on his sons with him, and shall anoint them, and ordain them, and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. You shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat and flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe and the ephod, and the ephod and the breastpiece, and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord in the entrance of the tent of meeting, and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, and the rest of the blood you shall pour on the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails, and the long lobe of the liver, and two kidneys with the fat that is on them, and burn them in the altar. But the flesh of the bull, and its skin, and its dung, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Then you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall kill the ram, and shall take its blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces, and wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and its head, and burn the whole ram on the altar. It's a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall kill the ram, and take the parts of its blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and on the tips of the right ears of his sons, and on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the great toes of their right feet, and throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar and the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and his sons' garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his sons' garments with them. You shall also take the fat from the ram and the fat from the tail and the fat from the covers of the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination, and one loaf of bread, and one cake of bread made with oil, and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You shall put all these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons, and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Then you shall take them from their hands and burn them on the altar on top of the burnt offering, as a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is a food offering to the Lord. You shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. And you shall consecrate the breasts of wave offering that is waved and the thigh of the priest portion that is contributed from the ram of ordination from what was Aaron and his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel, for it is a contribution. It shall be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings, their contribution to the Lord. The holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him, they shall be anointed in them and ordained in them. The son who succeeds him as a priest, who comes to the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place, shall wear them seven days. 
You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the ordination or of the bread remain until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons, according to all that I have commanded you. Through seven days you shall ordain them, and every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. Also you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it. You shall anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall become holy. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, day and day regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb a tenth measure of fine flour mingled with the fourth of a hin of beaten oil, and a fourth of a hin of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and shall offer with it grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning, for a pleasing aroma of food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tents of, tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Thanks so much for listening to God's Plan, Your Part. If anything stuck out to you, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to receive a Bible, you can email us at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting us through the link in our description. We love that you're on this journey with us, and we hope you have a great day. See you tomorrow.